turn with me to Genesis chapter 16 this morning, Genesis chapter 16, and I want to read, it's a short chapter, so I'm going to read this, uh, I think I'll read the whole chapter. This has got to be one of the most incredible stories in the Bible to me. Every time I read it, it just amazes me. Um, we are coming up on um, a sad anniversary of the Hamas war against Israel. And, you know, if you want to know where the Middle East problems began, if you want to know where the all of the troubles and issues and difficulties for Israel began, you have to turn to the pages of Scripture. It's amazing how when something happens in the Middle East, everybody suddenly becomes an expert on Middle Eastern affairs. But if I may respectfully say, if you have never read the Bible through, you are not an expert on the Middle East, no matter how much you know about foreign policy or government. Um, you have got to read Scripture to know where this all began. But isn't it amazing the division and the hate between the sons of Abraham? And... Isn't it amazing, too? And by the way, you might want to say amen to that because guess who else are sons and daughters of Abraham? If you're born again and have accepted Jesus, do you know we serve a Jewish Messiah? And I'm expecting a Jewish king of kings to come back and set up his earthly kingdom, and I'm a joint heir with him. I'm part of the family, adopted, grafted into the vine. I'm a descendant of Abraham because I'm born again by the blood of Jesus. Amen. I didn't mean to go off on all that. Let's read together in Genesis 16, verse 1. And by the way, as I read this, let me just mention that Sarai later becomes Sarah. Abram later becomes Abraham. I tend to get I tend to use those names interchangeably, so I don't want to confuse you if I call him Abram one moment and Abraham the next. It's the same guy. And as we read this, too, you're going to see a reference here to the angel of the Lord. If you've been under my pastorate for very long, you know who that is, because I've told you that in Scripture that is generally understood as a Christophany, which is an Old Testament appearance or a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord himself, Jesus. And we know that the angel of the Lord in this chapter is God or God the Son because he's called the Lord who spoke to her in verse 13. So that's the groundwork. Let's read together at verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now, understand culture here a little bit of that day and time. When Abram took this Egyptian slave as a concubine, she became a second wife to him. So this is not uh, something that we should understand strictly from our modern day culture and time. And... I uh, wanted to pass that on to you. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. There you have it. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. How, is this not a man? Y'all can laugh. It's okay. Uh, you're responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Whew. Yeah, there was some tension in that, wasn't there? I didn't, even, I didn't even read that with the tone of voice. It was probably spoken. <laughs> May the Lord judge between you and me. That was probably more like it. 
Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. And then Sarai mistreated Hagar. So she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur, and he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. My mistress, Sarai, she answered. And then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Now, that's a hard instruction when God tells you to go back and submit to someone who's mistreating you. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, which in Hebrew is a name that means God hears. For the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. There it is. Verse 13, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. Now, this is just incredible to me. That Hagar, who's an Egyptian, she is not a descendant of Abraham. She is not a child of of Abraham's covenant, right? And she's about to name the Lord. And this would be a God that she's never been introduced to. It would be a God that she didn't grow up being taught about. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well at that location, that well was called Bir Lahai Roi, which means the living one who sees me. And it is still there between Kadesh and Barad. So Hagar, Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. I want to talk to you today on the subject of the woman who named the Lord. And let's see what we can learn from the story of Hagar. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray that you will anoint our efforts. I pray, God, that you will bless us with your presence and speak to the hearts of the hearers and let your word not return void to you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. You know, over the past uh, several years, I have seen something unfold in our country that I think has got to be one of the most ungodly things I've ever seen in my lifetime. And I'm, I'm talking about a, a, a social practice that has become so much a part of our culture that we now have a name for it. We call it cancel culture. And that's how our culture is now characterized. It's characterized by this tendency to cancel people. And it's an expression that's used to describe the ostracism of a person or a group of people from certain social settings or even from society itself because someone doesn't like you for whatever reason. And so it's not that you've done anything wrong. It's not that you're a bad person. It's just that someone doesn't like you or for whatever reason they hate you and they begin to bully you and exclude you and devalue you as a human being. And you are deemed culturally worthless. 
in society who cancels someone uh, or some group of people. Uh, they believe that that person or those people shouldn't have a voice. They shouldn't have an opinion because you just no longer matter in this world. They cancel you as a person of value. And sometimes it takes really subtle forms. So, for instance, sometimes they'll just unfriend you from their social media. Raise your hand if you've ever been unfriended by anyone. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Don't unfriend me, please. Maybe they just unfriend you or something. Or, you know, sometimes it's a much more vicious and hurtful form of cancel uh, that our culture in, inflicts where you are publicly attacked or publicly ostracized. And it's usually just because of something you stand for, something you believe in, that you, you differ from them because of maybe your faith or, or what you uh, believe in this world. And... So they begin to publicly disregard you and disrespect you and reject you and, and you find yourself excluded and shunned and sometimes even by people perhaps that you have loved and you have served and you have cared for. Maybe someone that you thought was your friend and you know our society has really honed this skill of canceling certain cultures of people or certain individuals who belong to a certain group. Uh, we've really honed that skill. They're good at it. They'll stir up a gossip campaign and start rumors and encourage other people to get on the bandwagon to hate you like they hate you, right? Sometimes cancel culture takes extreme forms. By the way, this is really nothing new. It's just a name that we've come up with in our modern day society. But how many of you know Jesus was a victim of cancel culture in his days on earth, right? And sometimes it takes extreme forms where they begin to try to just wipe out an entire race or ethnicity of people or a certain group based on faith. They'll just try to do away with everybody. And our culture has, be has become good at this. Well, there is a spirit behind that. There's a spirit behind the whole cancel, cancel culture movement and it is in antithesis to biblical godly love. People are to be valued as those who are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, their creator, right? But, you know, this, this movement has spread like wildfire until even some people who attend some churches and uh, they identify as a Christian have taken it upon themselves to, you know, cancel certain people uh, who they just don't like. And I think sometimes we do that in order to feel better about ourselves. So this world is full of people who've been canceled. And isn't it interesting that Jesus is the one who came not just to save the Jews, but he came to provide salvation for the Jews and the Gentiles. And, you know, the Jews had a hard time with this back in his day and even in the early church that this same Holy Spirit is poured out on Gentiles. They had to wrap their head around that. It's like, I thought we were the seed of Abraham. And God had to teach them something about their theology. This world's full of people who feel rejected and unloved and unaccepted and shunned and cast away and devalued. And if you have ever felt that way, I want to introduce you to a woman who absolutely felt that way. And her name is Hagar. And her story occurs within the story of Sarah and Abraham and we read this story, or I read this story today to you. 
And when we see the story of Hagar, let me just be honest with you, we don't usually think of her with a warm, fuzzy feeling, do we? Because she represents the mistake that was made by Abram and Sarai when they became impatient with God in giving them a son of promise. And so Hagar is not really so much a person to us. She's a mistake to us, right? In fact, this may be the, one of the few times you hear a pastor preach a sermon on this woman. But if you've ever been canceled or felt rejected or worthless as a person, you need to hear the story of this woman's life. Let me start by talking about Hagar and the fact that she is a woman who was forsaken in the desert. It is amazing to me that the Bible says the Lord found her. When we're introduced to Hagar in Genesis chapter 16, we immediately begin to get a picture of her life. She's introduced to us as an Egyptian slave who belonged to Abram's wife, Sarai. We don't know how she came to be a slave, but I can tell you for sure that nobody came to be a slave by choice. I've never met anybody who said, when I grow up, I want to be a slave. It was generally through some unfortunate circumstances, like maybe the death of a husband or, you know, having no family to support her. And it was probably one of only two ways that she could survive in this world, either by prostitution or by slavery. So we can already surmise that she has had a difficult life and that she's already come through a lot of painful experiences to get to this place in life where she is. It's not a far stretch of the imagination to see her as a person who already feels pretty down on herself. Someone with a low self-esteem or a person who has little or no self-confidence. Hagar is, is probably not someone who has a lot of dreams and goals in life. And she's not a person of great influence either. She's not someone other people would look up to with a great deal of respect. In fact, people would look down on her. And that makes it even more painful to listen to the conversation Sarai has with Abram as she talks to him about Hagar in verse 2. In fact, it, it almost seems to me that you can sense her attitude as there might even be some blaming of God in her words. Did you pick up on that? The Lord has kept me from having children. You can almost get a sense of her displeasure with God for her own childlessness, even though God had told her, I'm going to bless you with a son. And as this conversation continues, you have to notice that nowhere in this passage of Scripture, this is interesting to me, nowhere does Abram or Sarai refer to Hagar by name. She's not really a person of identity to them. They refer to her not by name, but by what she is. They refer to her as my slave or your slave. Could be that she's younger, maybe more attractive than Sarai was. Sarai was up in years. But whatever the reason, Hagar viewed, Hagar is viewed by her owners as an object, a piece of property, perhaps a surrogate so that maybe Sarah can have a son through this second wife, this concubine. Maybe I can build a family for myself through her since God has kept me from having children. After Abram had slept with her and she became pregnant, notice they still refuse to refer to her by name as they argue about her. 
Sarah told her husband, you're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms. And now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. That was a pretty heated argument. And Abram says, well, your slave is in your hands. He doesn't even call her my wife. Wow. Do with her as you think best. And it says, so Sarai mistreated her. She began to <clears throat> treat her badly. Imagine being in the same house, maybe even in the same room. Raise your hand if anybody's ever talked bad about you. In church. No, don't raise your hand about that. That's just... Well, imagine being in the same house and maybe even in the same room as these two people are, are arguing about you. You are the topic of their conversation. And it's not a good conversation. They're arguing about you. You're the source of their misery in their conversation. And they don't even refer to you by name. You're not even a person to them. You're spoken of as if you have no value as a human being. She's just an object. And she didn't even choose these circumstances for herself. She's done nothing wrong to be so hated, so abused, so devalued. And as they argue over her within her hearing, it is no wonder that Hagar began to despise her mistress, Sarai. And so she decided to, to flee from Sarai into the desert to a place beside the road to Shur where she stopped to rest next to a spring of water where there was a well. And this tells us something more about her identity as a person. Her name, Hagar, by the way, while it seems to be of foreign origin, it has come to be known as a Hebrew name meaning forsaken or flight. And so it's someone who is abandoned in the desert. And I wonder how many people there are in this world who have been deserted and abandoned, who feel that because of the circumstances they've inherited in this life, they have no value and nothing of worth to offer to those around them. I wonder how many children go to sleep at night hearing their parents argue about them. Not even referring to them by their Christian name. I wonder how many, how many people have been mistreated as though they are hated and despised and rejected. And if that's you, boy, I've got something to tell you. I noticed that while nobody else wanted to call her by name, it was there in the desert next to this spring beside the road to Shur that the Lord found Hagar. And when he found her, the God who created her in his image called her by name. It is just incredible to me that the God of all creation knows your name and he knows my name. And the world may make you feel rejected and worthless and you know, like you don't have anything to offer, but there is a God who sits on the throne of heaven and rules over his creation, who knows not only your name, but he knows how many hairs are on your head. Jesus said that there's not even a sparrow that falls from the sky that the father doesn't know about it. And you're worth so much more than a sparrow. This God who flung the stars into the heavens and calls each of them by name, he knows your name. And he'll find you where you are and make himself known to you. What an incredible thought that God came down from heaven to find her. That's a, that's a person with value. 
And then secondly, let me tell you about a promise for the future that involves facing your past. The next thing I notice about this conversation she gets into with God, others were talking about her. God talks with her. And keep in mind, <clears throat> she's an Egyptian. I mean, who is she that God who spoke to prophets would want to speak to her? She's an Egyptian. And the Lord asked her two questions that are important for you to hear and consider if you can relate to Hagar. God asked her, Hagar, where have you come from? And secondly, he said, where are you going? Now, I got to tell you, God did not ask her that because he didn't know where she came from. And he did not ask her where she was going because he didn't know her future. God's not asking her where she used to live and where she's traveling to from, him, from here. These two questions really, I think, had little or nothing to do with geography, but they had everything to do with her past and her future. Notice with me that Hagar only has an answer to the first question, but not to the second one. She said, well, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. My past is just too hard. It's just too much. It's too difficult. I can't deal with it anymore. And when we cannot deal with it, sometimes the only thing we know to do is to try to run away from it. And so here she is running from her past. But she has no answer concerning her future. She doesn't know where to go from here. It could be that she's planning to head back toward Egypt, but that was a long way off, and she didn't know how she could get there. And I think there are a lot of people in this world like Hagar who know all too well where they came from. They know their past, but they have no idea where they're going or how to get there from where they've come from. And so Hagar was focused on her past and God was about to give her a future. God always has a future for you. And if there's anybody listening to me who's just about ready to give up, I want you to know God always has a future for you. But to get there, there's something you have to do. And the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. So understand, you see, running from your past never fixes your past, does it? Running from your problems don't make them go away. And so why would God tell her to go back and submit to what was so distressing in her life? Well, for one thing, I think God wanted Hagar to do the right thing because, listen to me, doing the wrong thing is never the right thing to do. So God wants you to do the right thing. I think somebody needs to hear this, and I'm not looking at anybody when I say this. This is my pastoral scan. I look at the walls and I say, doing the wrong thing is never the right thing to do. God wants you to do the right thing. And so I believe God wanted to use Hagar. Well, now brace yourself. I think God wanted to use Hagar to work on Sarai. Some of those people that are in your life that maybe you hate, God may have put them there to work on you. <laughs> All right, I'll just say amen to that myself. But even more than that, God told her to go back and deal with her problems instead of running away from them because God wanted to give her a future that she had never dreamed she would have. The Lord said, you're pregnant. And although he meant that she was literally pregnant with a baby, the word pregnant here is a word that speaks of something that's rich in blessings. And God began to explain to her the blessings with which she was pregnant. First of all, you who were nothing but an Egyptian slave with no husband and no family to care for you, you're going to have a son. And even more than that, I'm going to increase your descendants until they're too many to count. I'm telling you, for a woman who had nothing, she's about to have everything. 
And so face your past, deal with your problems, don't run from them. God will bless you with a future. And what happens next is even more incredible. Here's Hagar wandering in the desert. She was used and loathed, devalued and mistreated, a surrogate, nothing more. Now she's homeless and pregnant with no husband who cares for her and no supplies to make a long journey back home. Her life feels every bit of what her name declares her to be, forsaken. But the Lord finds her. And now she's having this conversation with the one true living God of all creation, a God whose name she doesn't even no. You understand, she grew up in Egypt. I don't know if you know this, but the Egyptians had over 1,400 gods and goddesses in their culture. She knew about a lot of gods that aren't gods. But she did not grow up knowing about this God that came and found her. But she did know there's something different about this God, and there's two things that she points out. One, he has heard her. I've heard your misery. In fact, later on, he hears her baby crying. And so this God seems to have ears. All those gods in Egypt I prayed to all those years, they never answered me. That's because they never could hear you. And here she is sitting in the desert, an Egyptian, and God's talking to her, and the thought must have occurred to her in her poor theology, I wonder which God this is. Because I've never had one talk to me. I've never seen one like this, like sort of in person, if you will. So who is this God? Now, in the Old Testament, God often revealed himself to his people by various names that would minister to their need at the time. For instance, to a shepherd boy who would later be the king of Israel, God revealed himself as Yahweh Reah, the Lord is my shepherd. And he would write the famous Psalm 23 about it. In Exodus 15, when the waters were poisoned to drink and the Lord healed the waters, he revealed himself as Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals all of your diseases. And to help them see that he would provide for them, God revealed himself as Yahweh Jireh, the Lord who provides. And when they needed peace, he revealed himself as Yahweh Shalom, the Lord is peace. He often revealed himself to people by various names. I have told you that names in the Bible mean something. And having been your pastor for a long time now, you should know what my name means. Because I've told you. Todd means fox. Well, Brother Richard, you didn't have to laugh. I know I'm about to have a birthday, but hang on. But you know, as far as I know, and I've read the Bible through many times, in every instance where one of God's names is revealed in Scripture, it is God who is revealing His own name to His people, with the exception of one time, and it's this time. This is the one place in the whole Bible where a human being names God. And it's not even an Israelite. It's an Egyptian. It's not anybody important. It's a slave. Someone who's forsaken. But God wanted to show a forsaken person that I will never forsake you. I'll find you wherever you are, even in the desert. And I'll come and talk to you and I'll come and call you by name because I know you. Because I created you.
And so she gave this name to the Lord who spoke with her, El Roi, the Lord who sees me, the God who sees me. When nobody else sees me and nobody else pays attention to me and nobody else seems to care. And out of all those gods I heard about growing up, there is only one God I've ever met who hears me, who sees me, who knows me, and who calls me by name. And for someone who's listening to me, who knows what it's like to be Hagar, let me introduce you to Hagar's God. He is the God who hears you. He's the God who sees you. The psalmist David would later write about this. He said, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths of hell, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. And if I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and he said, then the light becomes n like night. When the light is like night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. This is the God who sees you. No matter where you are, nothing can hide you from God. No darkness is dark enough to hide you from God. There's nothing about you that God doesn't know. This is his omniscience, his all-knowingness. He knows everything about you. He knows the number of the hairs on your head. He sees what you're going through, and he can deliver you, and he can provide for you, and he can bring you safely into his great purpose for the days ahead of your life. That's the God who will never forsake you, Hagar. So go home and face your problems and trust this God. I just imagine this Egyptian woman for the rest of her days trying to tell her people about this God of the Hebrews. I mean, I just imagine her saying, you know, I don't know everything about him. I can't tell you everything about him like some of those Hebrew people can. I, was, I wasn't raised a Hebrew. I didn't grow up in Hebrew church. I, I've never maybe even read the Hebrew scripture, but I, I just imagine she's telling all these Egyptian family members, but I can tell you one thing. This is the only God who ever heard me, and it's the only God who ever came and found me, and it's the only God who sees me. By the way, she went back home. And you know, we find the rest of her story in Genesis 21, and it was not a fairy tale marriage. Eventually, Sarah had Isaac, and she told Abraham, You get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that slave woman's son, won't even call him by name, will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. And it distressed Abraham greatly, but God told him, you listen to Sarah, God had a plan. God intended for Isaac to be the son of promise. Abraham gave Hagar some food and water and sent her and her son out into the wilderness into the desert of Beersheba. Soon the water ran out and she set her boy down under one of the bushes and went off and sat down nearby some distance away because she didn't want to watch her son die. And the Bible says she began to sob. She needed water. And she must have wondered, you know, where is that well called Bir Lahairoi, well of the living one who sees me? And the Bible says that God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Remember, Ishmael means God hears. He said, lift up the boy, take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. And then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. God kept his promise to Hagar. 
I don't know who needs to hear this, but it's incredible to me that this one person in all of Scripture got to name the Lord. And whatever your need is, God will make himself known to you as the one who meets your need. One thing is for sure. Two things are for sure. He definitely hears you. He definitely sees you. Right? You'll never pray a prayer he doesn't hear. You'll never go through something he doesn't see and know. And that's the God who will never forsake you. He's the God who will deliver you. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads with me. And if you'd say, Pastor, thank you. I needed to hear this. Just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Yes. Anyone else? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. And if you're watching our program, I encourage you to reach out, send us a message, let us know if God has ministered to you. But I want to pray for everyone who feels abandoned, rejected, or canceled. I want you to know the God who sees you. Father, I thank you for your word, and I pray that you will minister to all who have heard this. I pray that you will hear them, see them, make yourself known to them, find them, even in the desert. And I pray, God, that you will bless them as they grow in their faith in you. I pray, Lord, that we'll take this message and leave your house and carry it to a thirsty world of people who are hurting, who feel like they are devalued by society. Help us to remember that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in your image and that we should love people with the love of Jesus Christ who died to save them. And it is in the name that is above every name that we ask this, the name of Jesus that we pray. And everybody said, Amen.